Um, I couldn't confidently pick a first person, but it's definitely around in the 100s, at least the second half of the 100s. And so remember following Justin Martyr, the Logos theologian says there are two gods and two, two lords. You know, there's basically the one true God and there's also this lesser God who's less transcendent. Right? God can't be located, be incarnated, but hey, this Logos can do those things because it's sort of in between the one God, one God in creation. Um, in my own view, what happened was the God talk got a lot looser in the 100s. So in the New Testament, the influence is, is mostly Jewish and they're very stingy about referring to anybody else as a God. Uh, things are quite different by the time you get to the year 180, especially with mostly Gentile people in mainstream Christianity. So in the writings of the 100s and onward, they gleefully refer to Jesus as God and our God, um, generally not the one true God, but I think that ordinary people, when they hear Jesus being called God and think there's only one God, and they're also aware that sometimes the gods could appear among us, right? The pagans had incarnation type ideas avatars and so on i think it wasn't that unusual for ordinary people to say hey jesus is god in the flesh this is just god in human form or god visiting us physically somehow um there are apocryphal books in the new testament you know books that never really had a chance to make it into the canon from the late 100s and 200s sometimes which just seemed to confuse jesus with god and we know that the modalistic monarchians, such as the Praxius denounced by Tertullian, uh, we know that they were reacting against Logos theory by saying, no, don't tell me there's a greater God and a lesser God. There's only one God, only one creator. We uphold the monarchy of the father. And what you're calling the second God, the Logos, really is just the same God as the first God. It's just a manifestation of God or something, or a power of God or an action of God. So we know those people were around end of the 100s, early 200s. We know it because of the theological arguments, the Logos theorists uh, denouncing them. But we also know it because a few random books just seem to confuse Jesus and God. You know, not unlike your average evangelical in the pew today, because with all the, you know, all the sound and fury about Trinity theories and the two natures and so on, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of ordinary Christians just think Jesus is just God himself. Or they think that on certain days of the week. And then they read the New Testament and think Jesus is someone and God is someone else. It's just, it's just confusion. Um, so I think it's probably almost always been around. Yeah, so it sounds like it definitely predated what became a Trinitarianism. One. Yeah, and, we, and again, we know because uh, Novation, Tertullian, Origen, we know that people push back against their Logos theory and that some of them were collapsing the Father and Son or the Logos and God more like together into one. You can call me an egomaniac, megalomania, or whatever you wish with a messianic complex. I don't have any complex, honey. I happen to know I'm the Messiah. Amen. It's only a complex when you're confused. It's only a complex when you have some kind of neurotic, neurotic compulsions and some kind of subliminal pressures. Honey, I don't have any conflict about it whatsoever. I'm not in conflict at all. I know as much as the light is showing up there through four squares that I am God the Messiah.
because I have a picture of you in my mind and my mind's just not like any mind you've ever seen and so I'm going to out picture on you and I'm going to out picture on you and reverse the energy you're in trouble brother I'm going to let you take your tape because I want them to hear it I want you to take it to your investigating laboratory and I want those to listen and I want them to hear the ring of sincerity in my voice I want them to know what I'm saying I am God I'm the only God there is Terry Wogan said to you on the Wogan show, you claim to be the son of God, and you said yes. Well, I'm, I am, yes, I'm saying that. But what I'm saying is we're all the children of God. And, but some people come to earth, Jesus was one, there were many more before him, who are actually part of the soul of the Godhead. It's God incarnate on earth. That's what Jesus was, that's what these other people were before. Welcome to the real world. You ready? This is from a legislation archive from the Georgia House of Representatives in the 1995-96 sessions. This is Bill HB 1274 on the death penalty, guillotine provisions. How far along are we into enacting these bills worldwide? I don't know. Maybe they've been enacted already. But I just wanted to show you that in 1995 the ball was already rolling. Another ball that's rolling are the seven universal Noahide laws. They sound great from the outside, designed so to conceal some terrifying details on the inside. Firstly, they were signed into US law in 1991 by George H.W. Bush by Mar on March 26. Here's the bill and resolution. It was named Education Day. As you can see in the details of resolution HJ 104, they are the seven Noahide laws, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in 1996. Every single president since H.W. Bush has annually re-signed this resolution. Many world leaders have called for the acknowledgement and observance of the seven Noahide laws, including the President of the European Union in July 2014 and the Australian Governor General Michael Jeffrey in 2008. And this will be international law. So what's the problem? Well, just for starters, the law against idol worship will include, quite specifically, the worship of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, which the Noahide laws will classify as blasphemy, and the punishment for transgressing the seven Noahide laws and for blaspheming the ineffable name of God by calling Jesus God is decapitation. It is not yet, and these things must come to pass. Then the Antichrist comes. That's what Jesus, that's the guideline we have in the New Testament. Wars, rumors of wars, Antichrist. What we're hearing here from the law and the tradition of the Jewish people, according to the Talmud, it's wars and rumors of wars, then Messiah. Which leads to what may be the most interesting part of this video, which is the prominent rabbi who has been rising up in Israel over the past few years, Rabbi Rav Shalomo Yehuda. And this rabbi has been gaining a lot of prominence the past few years. He's actually considered the Yanuka, which is a person who rises up very rarely within generations, they say. That's how rare it is that some will rise up once every generation. And is somebody who knows the Torah and understands the Torah way beyond what anyone else says. There's stories of him just sitting at the Western Wall, speaking of the Torah. They say he's melting into himself and just speaking the Torah so well that these people are just awestruck at his teaching and what he's saying. Now, I'm not going to claim that this guy is the Antichrist or the false prophet, but as people rise up in prominence in these different religions all around the world, even in America, if a so-called Christian were to rise up and was not living according to the Bible and looked as if he would potentially fulfill the prophecies of the Antichrist or the false prophet, I would make a video on him as well. So I'm not saying that this is what this guy is, but when people rise to prominence and they could potentially lead to fulfill these prophecies, then they're just looked at and evaluated. And what's strange about this guy, first off, the fact that he's the Yanuka and he has this profound level of understanding of the Torah, as well as there's a video from 2021 at the Western Wall. First off, as he's walking up to the Western Wall, he's being completely crowded and surrounded and really crushed by the public trying to get close to him. Pretty strange just seeing the public in awe of such a figure as him for just being a rabbi. And he's so young, and that's part of the thing of the Yanuka that he takes up to the Torah so young. And there's a picture of him here at the Western Wall in the little section 
where normally it's made for very high up rabbis who are normally very old, who have been within the rabbinical order for a long time and they have this prominence. And then here they let this Rav Shalomo Yehuda guy in. And here they let him into this section of the Western Wall where normally they only allow very prominent rabbis in. And as you can see, all these people around watching him at the Western Wall, praying at the Western Wall. And you can even see, I'll put up on the screen, rabbis coming and kissing his hand, these more prominent rabbis, these older rabbis, showing their respect to him. So just strange seeing such a young figure rise up to the level this man is. And then a more recent, just as of yesterday, October 19th, 2022, one of the most prominent rabbis from New York goes and visits Israel to go and visit the Yanuka for what reason? Giving him his blessing? I mean, the Israeli people are expecting a Messiah. They're expecting this person to come, this person to save them. And this person will take the world by storm. And when they take the, and when the Jewish Messiah comes, he will fulfill everything the Jewish people are looking for. When the Islamic Messiah comes, the El Mahdi, he will fulfill everything the Islamic people are looking for. So it's just very interesting to see when we actually have a Jewish figure, a prominent figure within the Jewish community, rising up, fulfilling this potential messianic expectation that the Jewish people are looking for. To bring it all to a conclusion, we just always need to look back to the biblical text. The Antichrist and the false prophet will, of course, need to fulfill the biblical prophecies of what we know they will do in the end. False signs and wonders will follow them. They will create a peace treaty that will eventually be broken. The Antichrist will push the mark of the beast, which will be the number of his name, which will equate 666. Clearly, it will not be some hidden coded thing. It will be clear as day. People will have to make this choice very willingly. It will not just be some hidden thing like someone accidentally took the mark. So the Antichrist will push the mark of the beast and both the Antichrist and the false prophet will be in complete opposition of Christianity and believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Now those qualities will probably not all appear at once. So that's why it's good to just keep an eye out when people are rising to prominence. But these are factors that we always have to look back on to be completely sure who the Antichrist or the false prophet is when they come on the scene has to be backed up by the bible so again i'm not saying this guy is the antichrist or the false prophet but we have to look at prominent figures when they rise up men have so dastardly distorted what my spirit is that it is necessary for me to come upon the scene and i have i shall show you from time to time proofs of that so that you will have no further need of religion because the highest authority tells you that you have no further need of it. I've come doing all the things you ever imagined God to do and have never seen done. You have never seen anyone resurrected before your eyes and yet you have seen me do it repeatedly. You've never seen anyone shot down as I was before your eyes with the blood spurting from the body and heal themselves, yet I, the socialist worker, did that. It's beautiful to know God is a socialist worker. You can identify with that. God is a socialist worker. He is one of the people. He's an instrument of all that you have desired. All that freedom embraces, all that justice embodies, everything that sensitivity imbibes, that is what your God is. And I must say it is a great effort to be God. I wish it upon another, but no one else in the particular stratum of the class consciousness that we are in, evolving in, has the faculty that I do. When they do, I'll be glad to hold their coat. In the meantime, I shall be God, and yeah. beside me, there shall be no other. Yeah. We'll present two points that clearly show the Son is not the Father. One, the biblical principle known as agency, and two, scriptures that show the person of God who is the Father, is not the same person as his human son, Jesus. First, a quote from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, article on the word apostolos. The rabbi summed up this basis of the shaliach, the Hebrew for agent, in the frequently quoted statement, the one sent by a man is as the man himself. That is, the shaliach is as good as the sender, in all that he says and does in execution of his commission. Um, just want to start with this idea of 
um, Hebrew agency. And um, I'll be quoting, just going to be quoting it to show the audience what I'll be quoting from. I'll be quoting from this book, Modalism, the Original Orthodoxy. And this was uh, written by Bishop Jerry Hayes. So it's page 475. And he says, um, so although the principle of agency seems to have validity when dealing with the affairs of men, it fails completely when applied to God. The reason, because God cannot give his glory and name to another. This is what I was referencing before Isaiah 42 verse 8. It pertains to that golden rule. I say he cannot because he said he would not. One might argue for the principle of agency applying to Christ in his human nature, included in the mystery that is the incarnation. The Son of God is both Yahweh God and humanity at one and the same moment. These two natures have been referenced as the Son of God, the deity, and the Son of Man, the humanity. Some may feverish, feverishly extrapolate a principle of agency working in the Son of Man, nature of Christ. However, the Son of God nature has no need of this function because Jesus in this nature is the Almighty. And we find this in uh, scriptures such as Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the mighty God, or some uh, would render it the almighty God. This you will find echoed in the book of Revelation, where Jesus is referred to such titles. One could conceivably speak of a principle of agency with Christ as man, but it would be a moot point because his God nature and his man nature, though distinct, are perfectly united to make one person. I can give you an example. For instance, I am a son as well as I am a husband and I am also a father. So I have three separate distinct roles, but at no point someone would uh, uh, tell uh, me and, and uh, come to a conclusion or an interpretation, oh, well, Caleb has split himself, has divided himself in three separate distinct persons. That would be nonsense. Obviously, we're talking about separate roles, functions that I can fulfill being the same person, still having the same identity as Caleb. So um, in going on with this Hebrew, uh, this principle of Hebrew agency, um, it would be a moot point because in his God nature and his man nature, though distinct, are perfectly united to make one person. Therefore, we do not have another person from Yahweh acting as his agent. The position of Hebraic agency argues against the son and the father being two modes of the same individual by implying that Jesus being called God or even the father is answered by the law of agency. This argument is employed by subordinationists as a sophistry to neutralize the biblical text that identified Jesus as God. This view holds that whenever a superior commissioned an agent to act on his behalf, the agent was regarded as the superior himself. This is expressed in the Encyclopedia of the Jewish Religion, Agent Hebrew Shalia, which um, Carlos was explaining us in his presentation. The main point of the Jewish principle of agency is expressed in the dictum as person's agent is regarded as the person himself. And guess what, dear friends? This quote is coming straight from the Talmud. And I can give you the reference. Okay, this is Kiddushin 41b. And if any of you know about the Talmud, the Talmud clearly blasphemes Jesus Christ. So I find it interesting that uh, Unitarians would revert to this method 
of interpreting scriptures where Jesus is given titles as everlasting father, the almighty God, and applied that to a principle of agency, which is borrowed from the Talmud. And I have it here in Kedishin 41b. And, and if you want to check this, um, Carlos, maybe Carlos probably knows that I'm where I'm getting this from. It's from Chabad.org. In Kedushin 41b, it says here, Bora says, as Rabbi Yen Hoshua ben Kora says, from where it is it derived that the legal status of a person's agent is like that of himself, as it is stated with regard to the Pasha offering and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall slaughter it in the afternoon. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. Is it so that the whole assembly slaughters the offering? So the person agent is like that of himself. Okay, and it can be rather, it can be derived from here that the legal status of a person's agent is like that of himself. This is a quote uh, that is straight from the Talmud, which I personally um, disregard and consider it as uh, the traditions of men, um, the philosophy of men, uh, as Jesus said that the traditions and the teachings of the Pharisees were not of God. So I find it interesting that um, Unitarians would revert to the, these texts. I mean, okay. I'll, well, uh, yeah, I, I'd probably ask you one question. Um, sure. With, with this um, in mind, with what I've just presented, um, that this is a, clearly this principle of Hebrew agency, for, for you to use that so loosely, knowing if you've done your research on the Talmud, where Jesus is actually considered as a bastard, he's actually called the son of the prostitute, and he was fathered from a Roman centurion called Pantera. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. What, how, how do you reconcile that you're actually using texts from men that have rejected Jesus Christ to support your doctrine? How, how does that sit with you? Well, well sure. thank you. Oh. Very good question. Um, I don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And by the way, just throw this in. You can talk to Jesus. You can pray to Jesus, but as the Messiah, not as God, because he is interceding for you. Thank you. Carlos, that kind of adds into your next question here. Why is it so hard, Carlos, for people to show the honor and respect that is due to Jesus Christ? Why do folks still choose to treat him pretty much as the Pharisees did? Uh, why is it so hard for people? Well, it's hard for people. There's a there's a very uh, stark warning in Romans one, uh, where Paul uh, gets all negative and <laughs> and tragic about uh, humans and and our state and how creation is fallen, and at one point. Uh, Paul says that wicked people have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a human person. And, and I feel that today, well, for the longest time now, Jesus has been made the biggest idol ever at the expense of the only immortal, eternal God the Father. That's 1 Timothy 1.17. So, uh, actually... I would ask you to ask the question, why isn't the Father, God the Father, who Jesus is always telling us about, I came to reveal Him. Remember, that that, that, that was part of His mission. And in John 17, 25, as, as I quoted in my opening, He came to, to tell us about the Father and His apostles, His immediate ones, understood who He was talking about. And He was not talking about Himself, the same one person. All right, thank you. Caleb, you have any comments to that? Yes, I do. I, I actually do, because this is a mystery. 1 Timothy 3.16 clearly states that great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we find later on John 
uh, explaining the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is not a foreign concept in the Hebrew uh, culture. They were awaiting a time, even Job, I think it's in Job 19, where Job is trying to speak to God, who is a spirit, and trying to ask him, can you relate to my condition, to my pain, to my cancer? I'm sure you have uh, Tracy and Carlos, family members that had illness, uh, plagues. Who healed the sick? Who raised the dead? Jesus. If I am going to worship a being that is uh, a being that is worthy of worship, it will be Jesus. And why would we have to dis make a distinction between God, who did not perform that role? Um, I, I find that this is devaluing the message and uh, what Jesus has performed for mankind. Jesus has atoned us of our sins. Greater love has no man than to give his, uh, his, his own life for his friends. There is no greater love. Jesus explained that. And the definition of God is love. So if God is an impassable God, this is what I'm getting from your doctrine, and take no offense. You have a doctrine where you have an impassable God that cannot condescend to the feelings and the weaknesses of mere mortals. But the Bible teaches the opposite. It actually presents a God that is very much uh, familiar and is very much close to the humble and to the, to, um, to the weak of heart. So I would basically say that um, Luke chapter 10, verse 20, 22 says, uh, no one knows who the son is except the father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It's a revelation. And if you start to uh, contain that and constrain that to a philosophy, to a Greek philosophy, to vain deceit, as Paul says, we should not be spoiled by vain deceit. It's carnal and it's base. It's human wisdom, not divine. It's not a revelation. And if, if the mystery of godliness is great, well, to say to me that Jesus is a, just a human being, what mystery and what greatness is in that revelation? Please explain me. All right. From A History of Christianity by Kenneth Scott La Tourette, Harper and Rowe, 1953, page 260 and 261. Platonism had a marked influence on Christianity. It entered from many channels. Among them, the Hellenistic Jew Philo, you got your book who was there? utilized by some early Christian writers and through Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Augustine, and the writings which bore the name of Dionysius the Areopagite. The term Logos, which was extensively employed by the Christians as, as they thought about the relation of Christ to God, came from Greek philosophy, perhaps by way of both Stoicism and uh, uh, Platonism. I have, uh, I have Latin Irenaeus right, and right Tertullian, this is from Rufus M. Jones, where the first church uh, Christian teachers to begin the formation of a definite doctrine. The apologists were at one with their predecessor Philo, the Jew of Alexandria, and with the contemporary thinkers in the schools of philosophy. The supreme revelation of God they call the Logos. Heraclitus of Ephesus first used it, term Logos, 500 years before Christ. Philo, the famous Hellenist in the first half of the first century, fused the Greek and Hebrew conceptions into one single blend of immense importance and of momentous future influence. Logos is the divine agent, the image of God, the firstborn son of God, sometimes called by Philo and later writers, the Teros Theos, the uh, second God. Uh, now, we could quote sources back yeah, and forth here. <laughs> Let me ask you something. I believe Thank in you. the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes. I believe in his deity with all my heart. Right. I have <clears throat> repented of my sin. I live a godly life as Christ lives in me. I believe the Bible to be the word of God, the inspired word of God. I believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. I believe in loving lost mankind, giving my life for them. I deny the doctrine of the Trinity. I do not believe it is taught in God's Word, expressed in God's Word, implied, inferred, or any other way. Am I your brother in Christ? If you deny the Trinity, knowing full well what it says, I do. If you turn away from the grammar of the text and you repudiate, 1 John 2 says you're teaching the doctrine of the Antichrist. 
I don't Walter turn away has, from Walter the grammar has, of the text. Sure I you turn do. away from your you're, you're interpretation on tape denying of the away, grammar. You're on tape denying A.T. Robertson, denying Granville Sharp, denying every grammatical scho scholar there is, and you can't read the language. If that be so, I don't deny the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't deny Paul. I don't deny John. Mm -hmm. right. I don't deny Isaiah. I don't deny Moses in 6-4 of Deuteronomy. But the man, the son, as the son, is the man. God as God is the Father, because God was manifested in the flesh to become a man in order to save his people from their sins. Origin of Alexandria gave us an important clue to what the early oneness molas had taught about the word or logos being the impersonal utterance of the Father deposited in words until the child was actually born as a son later on in time. In his commentary on the Gospel of John, Book 1, Chapter 23, Origen wrote, and I quote, I wonder at the stupidity of the general run of Christians. Now, all historians here that I have read, everything I have I've heard and read on this passage proves that Origen was writing against the modalistic monarchians, the oneness, when he called them stupid. And he also identified them as the general run of Christians. He goes on to say, I do not mince matters. It is nothing but stupidity. They proceed differently and ask, What is the Son of God when called the Word? The passage they employ is that in the Psalms, My heart has produced a good word. And they imagine the Son to be the utterance of the Father deposited, as it were in syllables. They do not allow him any independent hypostasis nor are they clear about his essence. I do not mean that they confuse its qualities, but the fact of his having an essence of his own." End quote. Greetings, friends and neighbors. The voice from the Near East, a voice from Iran, salutes you, friends, in the great, glorious name of our Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer, and Savior. This is our fifth broadcasting on the great, proper, supreme, main, majestic names of our God. You will appreciate much more this fifth broadcast if you have heard the four previous broadcasts on same blessed Bible subject, names, proper names of our God. For these messages are like a golden chain of five links together. For you, for the sake of you dear people who have not heard the previous messages, I just wish to review for a minute what did we speak in these four previous broadcasts. We spake on four gods, dispensational proper names given by himself to his people for doing great things among them. The first name he gave, Almighty God pronounced and gave to Adam and his generation was Elohim, the name of Creator of all things for dispensation of creation. And the second name he introduced himself to Abraham was El Shaddai, a name to create a new race, a new nation, through Abraham and his descendants. The third name of same God for dispensation of law was given to Moses, and it was Jehovah, or Yahweh, or Ahia, or I am that I am. And the fourth proper name of same God, Elohim, in Shaddai, Jehovah, was pronounced before the birth of the Savior of the world. 
by angel in a dream to Joseph that his intended wife was conceived by the Holy Ghost and she'll bring forth a son and that his name he shall call Jesus in Hebrew Yahshua and that it was to be called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. He was to be called Jesus or Yeshua or Savior or Jehovah Savior because he was none else but Emmanuel or God with us as Isaiah had prophesied in the same chapter of his book. And we take two of these names and analyze them one by one in those four previous messages. And we came to the last of these four names, which was Jesus Emmanuel, and we wish blessed, great, highest name of deity for dispensation of grace, dispensation of spirit in which you and I are living in. Now, <clears throat> why the Almighty had left this fourth proper name of Bible tells us it was the greatest name of all his names, for it was to, to commence the greatest dispensation, the greatest of God's acts upon the earth among the children of men. You see, Elohim, our Almighty, our Creator God, was only a name that created all things. El Shaddai was a name that created a nation. And Jehovah was a name to deliver his nation, Hebrews, from the bondage and create new laws and bylaws and precepts best ever were known on earth, given to Moses and Israel to teach their children and children's children and the whole world. What dispensation of grace Jesus Emmanuel name is to recreate, to regenerate, to make a people greatest and the highest of all creation, of all beings God has ever made on earth, yea, even above the angels. For in Jesus, Christ, the only begotten of the Father, the man of Galilee, the Savior of the world, God, Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah, not only becomes God of Jews and patriarchs, but he becomes God of the universe, God of all races, tongues, and kindreds. And not only the deliverer of Israel from the land of Egypt, from the hand of that enemy, but the deliverer from the power of sin, from the power of Satan, from the power of hell, from the power of eternal, unknown torments. Yes, that makes the fourth proper name of deity, the fourth proper name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the fourth proper name of Elohim, El Shaddai, Yehovah, to become greatest name of all names. And uh, we read in Psalms 138, first and second verses, as following, I praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Mind you, thy word above all thy name. That means the word which became flesh, 
the word of the promises God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to patriarchs, the word, that voice that pronounces previous names, all these have now not only been pronounced in one name, Jesus Emmanuel, but they are embodied this time, not in a voice, not through angels, but in a very personification of deity in the person of the only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, praises be unto our Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer, who is not only God of Jews, but is God of Gentiles. He's not only to deliver us from our other enemies, but deliver us from our spiritual eternal enemies, to deliver us from eternal loss, to deliver us from our fallen nature, and to save us, to sanctify us, to fill us with his own spirit, and someday to close us with immortality, body like his own, and make us even higher than angels, the very sons and daughters of Almighty God. This all comes to us by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because in that name involves all infinite love and grace and mercy of God for all who will believe. Oh, friends, let's believe it. God bless you, and thank you for listening.